Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you once again for joining us here on this virtual format for our first lunchtime expedition presentation of 2021. A couple of quick announcements before we introduce today's speaker. Um, support for these programs, the lunchtime programs have been made possible by the Nancy Carol Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as Sage Creek Ranch. Uh, these sponsors really do help make everything that we do possible. Um, so we're grateful for their support as well as our audience, you all, who continue to come to our programs um, and provide us feedback on how we can best improve our, our um, offerings. Um, we are recording these lectures and uploading them to our Draper YouTube channel. Uh, complete presentations from previous years can be found there um, for your viewing pleasure. So just go to youtube.com, type in Draper Natural History Museum, look for our bear logo and you'll get a, you'll find a link to all of our previous presentations there. Um, you're also welcome to uh, email me at coreya at centeroftheWest.com or .org, excuse me, there will be a um, link to that. Uh, it will be on the uh, outro slide. Um, if you are not currently on the email list for lunchtime presentations, we do them the first Thursday of every month. Um, you can email me there and I will get your name added to uh, our listserv. Um, so we are broadcasting today's presentation over Zoom webinar. Um, due to technical difficulties, this was unable to get uh, broadcasted to Facebook Live, but we will get a video up there um, afterwards uh, for those um, who are who are usually view us on that platform. Um, you are welcome to at any point throughout this presentation to use Zoom's Q&A feature or the chat box to submit questions. Uh, we will relay them to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Um, we encourage uh, anyone who's interested to engage with our speaker. Um, so that said, I am very excited to introduce our speaker today, uh, Wenjing Xu. I first saw Wenjing present um, her research at the uh, Wildlife Society Conference in Sheridan a couple of years ago. Um, and I knew then that at some point we would have to get Wenjing to present here at the Draper. Um, her work on modeling species interactions with fenced landscapes has broad applications uh, wherever fences dominate the landscape. Um, and I'm excited for you all to get to know a little bit more about Wenjing and her research. Wenjing Xu is a PhD candidate in wildlife ecology and rangeland ecology at the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research draws on movement and landscape ecology and applies geospatial tools to understand impacts of our increasingly fragmented world. She is motivated to better understand socio-ecological dynamics in landscapes shared by humans and wildlife and to seek a balance between wildlife conservation and human well-being. Wenjing was born in Hangzhou, China and obtained a BS degree in natural resources at the China University of Geosciences, as well as a master's of science degree in geography at the University of Georgia. Aside from research, she is interested in multimedia science, communication, filmmaking, and gardening. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to Wenjing. Great. Uh, can you see my screen well? Cool. Thank you, Corey, for this uh, really nice introduction. It is my honor to start us off this lunch talk series in a new year. Um, and also thank you everyone to spend this hour with me. So today's topic is both personally and professionally profound to me. I am going to lead you through my own journey of getting interested, getting surprised, getting confused, and getting to understand a little bit more about this prevalent and impactful landscape feature fencing. So my story starts when I graduated from college in China, when I took a trip to the Tibetan Plateau. Just like mo almost everyone, I had this romanticized imagination for Tibet. Abundant wildlife, yak herders, open rangeland, snow mountains towards the end of the horizon. Um, many of them are true, but for one thing, open rangeland. Yes, the landscape is uh, really spacious, but when you take a closer look at the land, you realize there are fences everywhere. I was a little bit disappointed. I know I was imagining that I may be able to ride a horse in Tibet like this, and then suddenly I realized there's a fence. 
you know, many scientists started to study something because they had some dramatic experience with their study objects, like become doctor because their family had a special medical history. And I am similar to that because I feel like my beautiful imagination about nature is so tainted by fences. So I decided to learn more about them. So with that motivation in mind, I started my PhD program here at UC Berkeley. What is weird is that I soon realized there are other people who also had interesting experience with, fence, with fences in their own research system. This is Dr. Alex McInturf. He works in the Hopland Research Center in Northern California. Hopland was and still operated with sheep ranching, which means there are fences across the property. And this photo was taken after the Mendocino complex fire in 2018. It's a large fire that burned for more than three months. And look at the two sides of this landscape that's divided by this fence pole. What we see here is that fence line clearly cuts through a landscape where on the one side is burned and on the other side is intact. This is almost like some sort of hidden landscape construct along a fence line is suddenly exposed because of the fire. And I will come back to this ecosystem contract later. The other colleague is Christine Wilkinson. She works within and around the Naruku National Park in Kenya, a protected area close to the city of Nairobi and was fully fenced around its boundary. She noticed that while I certainly don't like the idea to be constrained by fences and, their cam and her camera traps recorded a ton of different type of animals crossing the fences. It is a little bit weird to us because seeing these animals disobey the fences that are intended to protect them from human disturbance outside of the fence. So the three of us decided to team up and conduct a review of literature, trying to uncover more of this kind of hidden story of fencing around the world. This research revealed a couple of surprises to all of us. Firstly, uh, there are actually a lot of ecological research that has been done about fences, covering over 60 countries. However, more than half of the studies was conducted in only five countries, United States, Australia, South Africa, China, and Botswana. Another issue is that most of the studies are idiosyncratic, meaning that they are narrowly focused and lack a framework that can help us to put together different impacts of offenses to see the full picture. Specifically, most studies focus on one single species, mostly mammals, and we don't really know how fencing functions at a system level. Studies from each geographic region also show some strong thematic preferences. For example, most study in conservation fence are uh, about conservation fences are from Africa, even though countries all over the world are putting up fences around protected areas. And most studies in Australia focus on how to deter invasive species, even though the whole country is basically a livestock production heavy country. And our second surprise comes from the sheer amount of fences that exist all over the world. For example, in 2014, Poor et al. used a spatial model and predicted that there is greater than 260,000 kilometers of fencing in the Highline region of Montana, which if you stretch them out, starting from Earth, you will be 70% of the way to reach the moon. With a similar method, we estimated the amount of fencing in Western United States, and the results came out with over 1 million kilometers of fences. Note that we didn't even try to include the property fences in urban and suburban areas. This map on the right shows the distance to a fence from any spot in this area. Basically, no matter where you are in the Western US, on average, you're going to be within three kilometers from a large scale fence. And then we have the longest fence in the world, the dingo fence in Australia, that they use to deter the feral dogs. And if you follow it from the North Pole, you will be 88% of your way to reach the center of the earth, just one single fence line. But what's more, 
fences continue to grow. Border fence might be one of the best examples, and it is definitely not unique to the US. In Europe, for example, there is more kilometers of border fence right now than it did during the Cold War. The exponential increase of fencing can also be found in the Mara area of East Africa. In this series of maps, the red area, the red areas are fenced. And you can see how the fenced area increase like pepper and salt sprinkled over the landscape. From the time new fence, often the time new fences emerge along edges of old fenced areas and they're mostly large private wildlife conservancies. So one thing to notice is that behind both the political fence and the Mara fence example, fencing growth is correlated with complex global trends of shifting geopolitical forces and global land rush, privatizing tons of tons of previously public and common use land for private profit oriented purposes. Last but not the least, fences are often omitted from global assessment of human impacts on nature, such as human footprint index. Fencing is omitted for some good reasons. Um, many people try to understand how human alternate landscape through remote sensing, such as how agricultural land distribute around the world. But fences, it is so thin that in order to see it from the space, it requires very high resolution sensors, which means current fence mapping only relies on field visits and agency records. And the fence mapping over large scale is both technologically and financially difficult. So far, most fences on Earth are not recorded. That's why earlier we will only be able to estimate fence locations in the Western US rather than actually mapping them. Global assessments like human footprint are widely used by scientists for understanding global changes, but by land and by land managers for conservation evaluation and planning. We want to see if we if we do consider fences, can we actually add extra information to our understanding of human alterations on landscapes? So we overlaid our estimation of fence location with the human footprint in the same area. And we realized that fence density can be high in areas where human footprint index considers as low human impact, as shown in the red area in this figure. So these red areas are very likely to be omitted from any large scale conservation efforts. Omitting fence means all associated ecological impacts of fencing are also likely to be not considered as well. So what exactly are these potential impacts? To answer this question, let's go through the scales of ecology. So first, at a physiological level, fencing can cause injury and sometimes direct mortality. For example, pronghorn is known for not being, not being very good at jumping. So uh, in order to cross the fence, they usually go under the wire, which will leave their, the, which will leave some scar on the back of uh, on their back and may they may prone to infection for the rest of the life. Additionally, crossing under or jumping over is simply extra energy expenditure. During harsh seasons, energy reserves can be crucial for animals fitness or even survival. At the behavioral level, fencing can directly affect animal movement and other behaviors such as foraging and predation. For example, in this upper left photo, this spot has been used for many animals to dig under the fence to cross. And over time, this crossing stop spot become a water reservoir and create some little habitat for birds to hang out and take dirt bath. And sometimes these behavioral change can last even when the fences are gone. For example, researchers have noticed that red deer on the border, uh, at the border between the Czech Republic and old West Germany still do not cross the divide, even though the fences were removed a quarter of a century ago. 
Population wise, fencing can impact wildlife distribution and density. As an example, a study looked at the impact of fencing in, on wildlife population in the Athai Kaputie ecosystem in Kenya. The bar plot here show the population change after fencing, especially in area where fence density is high, wildlife population have collapsed to a small fraction of their former abundance. The heat map on the left shows the fence impact on wildlife distribution. And let's focus here to see the wildebeest. Their distribution has been effectively squeezed from this whole area to this little corner here. Whereas the Thomson's gazelle is doing better at maintaining its general distribution. This is showing us that some species can be more susceptible to fence impact than other species, which leads us to the next level of ecological impacts of fencing, the community level. A study has looked at the fence crossing rate and time spent on each side of the fence for four predator species in northern Botswana. The map here shows the GPS location colored by each individual animals. And the plot here summarizes the mean number of GPS locations derived from the species with X axis shows the distance to fences. The middle one is exactly where the fence are located. And the Y axis is the uh, number of GPS locations. The more GPS locations, the more time animals spent at certain area so we can see here that fencing is an effective barrier for all species, but especially for lion and cheetah. Uh, the smaller predators, on the other hand, can still move across fences, even though they still show a clear preference to the northern part of the fence. This is showing us that fences influence the spatial distribution and the relationship of otherwise co-occurring species. By excluding some species, but not the other from particular habitats. In this way, fences change animal community structure and interaction. And finally, with all the ecological impacts we observed at physiological, behavioral, population, and community level, all, all accumulated up to this ecosystem level. And then fundamental ecological processes such as hydrology, soil and fire dynamics can be altered. And the sharp change happens specifically along fence line. And these are some really textbook examples of impacts of extreme landscape fragmentation, where instead of having a natural gradient across the landscape really smooth, we have sharp cutoffs of drastic different habitat patches. So to me, the, to me personally, the most fascinating effect of fencing happens across the social and ecological systems. A prominent example is the enclosure movement in the England uh, in, the in the 1700s. By mass fencing land, land become properties and are attached with values and labors. This movement is one of the key elements of industrial evolution and forever changed our society and our way of viewing and managing nature. Notably, the enclosure movement does not only belong to the 1700s. Some of the cases we discussed earlier are just like a modern form of enclosure movement. So here I like to quote Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the first man who having fenced in a piece of land said, this is mine and found people naive enough to believe him that man was the true founder of civil society. Interesting enough, the design of fencing itself also reflects different values of the society it is located in. So here are some pictures that I took in Tibet that showing they have prayers flag hanging all over on fences. And this is the fence that we have here in the US. So let's take a closer look at fences here in the West. Even though my current work is largely ecological, I want to first introduce the very interesting history of fencing in the West to set the stage. Because again, ecological impacts of fencing are socially rooted. As many of you know, in 1862, President Lincoln signed the Homestead Act, 
offering 160 acres of free land to anyone who settled and farmed it for five years. Settlers started heading west, and then they quickly encountered a problem, fencing. In the great sea of grasses, there just weren't enough trees for them to build their traditional type of lumber fence. So although the land was fertile, there was no way to stop many cattle from trampling and destroying crops. And thus their claim to the land cannot be sufficiently fulfilled. That started the fence design competition among many farmers. So nowadays, if you go to the Devil's Rope Museum in Texas, you'll be able to find hundreds of barbed wire, barbed barbs design. And then we got the winner, Joseph Golden. His design wasn't the first, but was the best. It uses small amount of material, easy to mass produce and effective in deterring cows. By 1876, his company was producing nearly 3 million pounds of barbed wire annually. In the beginning, the West was operated under open range law. Those wanting to keep animals off their property have to erect a fence to keep the animals out. Starting from resource rich areas, more and more land are therefore fenced. But soon animal herders realize all good grasses and water are fenced off by others and they have to join the fence game too in order to have anything to feed their herd. So in this way, fence out transformed to fence in, fence all available land and resources, which eventually leads the entire landscape to be covered with fences. And here's the fun fact, even though some may argue that telephone is the best invention around the 1900. Others argue that barbed wire fencing actually is the most transformative because they, pre they even served as telephone wires to farmers in rural areas at the time. People like Reveal Nets think the barbed wire brought the huge changes to the American West much more quickly than telephone. And he argues that barbed wire fencing defines the ecology of modernity. Along with the technological invention of barbed wire fencing, science at the time also played a huge role in making fencing a standard of rangeland management. In 1907 to 1909, there is an experiment conducted by the US Department of Agriculture and US Forest Service in East Oregon. Nearly no other scientific experiment in history has influenced more land than this very one. A professor on my committee, Dr. Nathan Sayer, documented this experiment in detail in his book, The Politics of Scale. And here I'm going to briefly go through it, the experiment that has made rangeland management how it is today. And then the experiment design is simple. In the natural setting, we have human herders uh, to protect herd from the predators. And in this experiment, they fenced off a pasture exterminated predators in the pasture and take and take away the human herders because they think there's no need for humans to take care of the herd anymore. And at the same time, they have a hunter patrolling around the fence to prevent any predators from going inside. And data was then collected on vegetation, sheep performance inside and outside of the fence. And two years later, success was declared. They claim that Predator control plus fencing result in better use of grass, fatter livestock, and less labor costs. Based on this experiment, the model of rangeland management that they pioneered was applied across the US. Predator control occurred nationwide and hundreds of thousands of miles of fences were built. This model was also aggressively promoted overseas to other countries. Until many years later, multiple lines of evidence start to question this exp experiment. First, there are some confounded variables, including sheep breeds, herd practice, vegetation types, and extra that's not really discussed and um, sees apart in this experiment. And then it might be the hunters rather than fencing itself that contribute the most from livestock uh, to the livestock protection part and then the cost of hunter is not 
considered in the calculation of the cost. And the actual cost of the type of predator proof fence that they built was way too high to implement across over large landscape. So the fences that was built afterwards was actually simplified and more close to what we see right now, like a four wire barbed wire fence. And in recent decades, scientists started to challenge the predator control program and try to reverse it, which includes the reintroduction of, of wolf in Yellowstone. However, fencing today is still treated as a standardized operation for rangeland. So look at this history. We wonder whether restoring predators can only be compatible if more connected landscape too is restored especially considering that much of the land in the West are mostly fenced, and, but they're also home to wide ranging animals like pronghorn, mule deer, bighorn sheep, elk, and moose. So on the right here, you can see the map of example movement routes of this species. On the left, you can see the complex administrative matrix that these animals are moving through. It's a mix of public and private land. Between management agency boundaries and within each boundary, animals likely need to cross many, many fences in order to move from point A to point B. The good thing is that people on the ground started to notice the impact of fencing on animal movement and initiated fencing modification and removal projects, especially in places like Wyoming where long distance animal migration is so potent and people started to think about how to return to a more wildlife friendly landscape. States like Wyoming and Montana, um, they have some fence, wildlife friendly fence guide for landowners. And organizations like Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation and Absarica Fence Initiative, which Corey is a part of, are actively engaging with local communities for fence conservation. They organize groups of volunteers to make fences more wildlife friendly. So what is actually wildlife friendly fencing? So here is an example of a not very friendly uh, fence that you have a bottom wire, bottom wire really close to the ground and leaves very little space for anything to go across under. And then we have wildlife friendlier fences and they are more permeable for wildlife while still be able to keep livestock inside. Specifically, they have smooth wire at the bottom and at the top and sometime on the top was equipped with some very visible material uh, to make animals be able to see them and don't run into them unintentionally. And also the bottom wire is at least 16 inches away from the ground. So animals like pronghorn can go under it more easily. So now we know what to do if we do find a problematic fence, but we still face a major challenge. If we look back at this land matrix, we know that fences spread across the landscape and across an administrative boundaries. Let's take a look at this specific areas. This is the sub black county in Wyoming. By combining agency data and high resolution remote sensing images, we tried our best to map all fences in the area. Uh, in this one county alone, the total length of fence adds up to 4,498 miles. That is double the length of US-Mexico border. Additionally, the cost of fencing modification might reach $10,000 per mile, including materials and labor. It is simply not possible to make all of them wildlife friendly. So here is the big question. How do we prioritize limited conservation resources to maximize conservation outcome while minimizing the cost? With the advancement of animal tracking technology, we have our answer to let the animal themselves to tell us where are the problems. The color line here shows 10 pronghorn individual colored with GPS um, trackers moving through the landscape, interacting with fences. By studying their movement pattern, 
we may be able to find out at which location are their movement impacted the most, the most heavily by fences. Specifically, if we look at animals' behavior upon encountering a fence line, we'll notice that fence do not only change whether or not they can cross a fence, but also how are they crossing the fence. For example, sometimes an animal come up to a fence pacing back and forth for a while before it finally decide which specific location it, it will try to cross. Sometimes it will succeed and sometimes it didn't. When it fails to cross, it might repeat this whole searching back and forth type of behavior again until they find a location to cross. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Nandia Dajit, in her own work in Mongolia, noticed that one Mongolian gazelle traced along the China-Mongolia border fence for 20 days before finally giving up. And this is some really abnormal behaviors, but exactly this type of behavior will be able to tell us where fences are bad, where are, are the animals wanting to cross. So we decided to use such behavior as indicators for the level of permeability of fencing. So we combined our field observations and record, records from literature. Then we came up with a barrier behavior classification scheme. So first we have the most ideal situation. If an animal wants to cross, it will just directly go through. And sometime it might just hang around the fences and trying to forage around, play around, which means their behavior near fence line are nothing that different from their behavior out, uh, away from the fence line. And then we have the, our first altered behavior, which is when animals try to go across and it couldn't and it bounced away. And then they have this kind of back and forth pacing uh, on one side of the fence trying to cross. And then we have the trace, as was just described, and the animal can move parallel to a fence line for extended amount of time. And finally, we have a trapped behavior, which is uh, when animals that keep being near fences but couldn't really go out, it might be caused by a very in, like a enclosed fence pasture. So following this classification scheme, we created an automated classification algorithm. On the left, you will see this yellow line represent fences and this uh, gray line, gray dots represent GPS locations. And on the right, we locate each event where animals encounter a fence. And this event is classified as one of the barrier behavior type as previously described. And then the next step is to grab these behavioral information to guide conservation needs. Here we see this uh, fence map that we should see before, but with the most problematic fences highlighted. We calculate the impermeability as the ratio of altered movement behavior to total fence encounters. And managers can also customize their own standard of what do they think is the abnormal behavior for their specific species based on their local knowledge. Once general fence segment is located, we can then zoom in to see at which locations specifically along the fence are different types of behavior happening. So in this case, along this purple long fence, here we can see some uh, back and forth behavior happening right here. With that, we can be even more precisely pinpoint the problematic fence sections. And in addition to helping uh, with fence modification planning, this method can also be used to evaluate past modification projects. With animal movement, with animal movement data before and after fence modification, we'll be able to quantify the level of improvement in landscape connectivity for targeted animals. And then in addition to the conservation component, our research also provided very interesting ecological insights uh, and my future research will take closer look at. First, we can see that pronghorn is more susceptible to fences than mule deer. 
Here in this plot, the y bar is different fence buffer distance at which we attempt to classify barrier behaviors. And the x bar shows the frequency of each type of behavior. And we can see that at almost all and at all distances, pronghorn encounter fences more frequently than mule deer. And in fact, if we look at the highlighted bars, which is the optimal distance for the two species for detecting their barrier behavior, uh, we will notice that the one individual pronghorn encounter fences almost 250 times a year, twice the encounter rate of mule deer. And pronghorn were also more likely to bounce away while mule deer engage more with back and forth, trace, and average movement closer to fences. And then both animals show seasonal variation in barrier behaviors. So here the x-axis is the month and then the y-axis is the frequency of each um, behavior. And we can see still pronghorn is more, has more variation uh, in terms of the seasonality than mule deer. And for both species, um, there are relatively big individual variations. Each bar, the, the size of the arrow bar is the individual variation. Um, and my next step of analysis will really dig into this and try to understand the causes and consequences of this variation. Because basically they're showing us some individuals even within the same species, some individuals are better at dealing with fences than others. So um, to wrap up, when people think about fences, they think about good fences make good neighbors. But once we put this sentence back to its context, we see a different picture. There where it is, we do not need the wall. He is all pine and I am all apple orchard. My apple tree will never get across and eat the cone under his pines, I tell him. He only says good fences make good neighbors. The intention for Robert Frost to write this sentence is to cast doubt on this very saying. And this is my purpose of my work, not simply judging the good or bad about fences, but put fence back to its lost context, both ecologically and socially. So with this more critical view, we maybe realize that there where it is, we do not need a fence. With that, I want to thank many people and agencies and funders and the land that make my research possible. And also shout out to the Fence Initiative around Wyoming and Montana region. They always are looking for volunteers to do more fence modification work. And you can go to their website and sign up and look around and um, we appreciate your participation. Um, by the way, that's the fence we build in our own backyard. And that <laughs> concludes my talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Wenjing. Um, for those of you watching online, again, you can submit your questions using um, either the chat feature or Zoom's Q&A. We did have a couple come in already. Um, see, Tom asks, Wenjing, uh, could the distribution, this is going back to uh, the fence discussion in Africa, could the distribution of feline predators be due to sequestration of their prey? Uh, which, which, like the, the study that shows different predators are going through at different rate? Yeah, this was with the, uh, the lions and the cheetahs, I believe. Oh, yeah, I think that's definitely part, um, it could be possible, but I think also, um, I think the study did another kind of comparison that like in other areas, this doesn't happen in similar environment in other spots when there is no uh, fence and also they actually compared the river as a natural barrier with fences as an unnatural barrier and even though similar pattern was um, was shown as a barrier effect but fences is definitely more potent than a river as a natural barrier. So Ellen asks does live fencing have the same ecological impacts as wood or barbed wire or chicken wire fences? That's a good question. I will actually think that um, from a barrier perspective, they are 
still like changing people's way of viewing the land because there is a there is a marking saying like this is a property but uh definitely ecologically i think natural natural fencing with like living fence hedge hedge rows are they themselves are kind of habitat for some little species um so to some degree i will say they are better ecologically um but as a symbol they are pretty much the similar to uh, artificial ones. Kyle asks, um, so this is in regard to the modeling work that you've done um, looking at the different response features. Um, did that study look at which type of barbed wire fences caused the most trouble, bounces or other for ungulates in Wyoming? So any- Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, totally. We really, when we try to map the fence, uh, we really wish we can also capture the types of types of fencing. But the only way really to figure out what exact fence it is, like whether it's what old sheep fencing or whether it's like a new type of uh, smooth wire fencing, it really needs to you know go to the field and record one by one like which type of fence it is. So we really don't have any information for that. And one hope is that we can do like a reverse process once we identify the most problematic fencing and you can go to the field and then go check what exactly the structures are. And then we are actually going to hope to work with um, some BLM staff so then like we can do some field checking on the specific ones that we um, identify. And also note that um, for, for the study itself, we only used 24 individuals uh, of pronghorn and uh, 24 individuals of mule deer as a proof of concept of this specific type of model. And in order to really evaluate fences for the area, definitely the more uh, colored animals, the better and like a better sampling representation for the population distribution will be the best. Simon asks, have you explored using artificial intelligence to identify fence locations? That's again, a very good question. And I am actually right now working with some people who are interested with um, applying the, what do they call the pattern recognition, deep learning stuff to fences. And um, actually yesterday they were like asking me like, what's the difference between a fence line or a high resolution image versus like a, you know, two track road. And sometimes you need to really zoom in and then you can see a little bit of the, the structure of the fences. So I think it, so right now we are at the stage that uh, like I'm training these people to, to, to recognize fences from very high resolution images. But then another challenge is the ac like the access for large area high resolution images is not really freely available. And we are trying to see whether we can work with maybe Google or Microsoft so then we can have access to the data set for training. Yeah, so hoping that we are moving towards that direction. Another, uh, we have a few more coming up as well. Steve has asked, uh, have you tried to use the abnormal behaviors of bouncing back and forth and tracing to identify fencing problems in areas where you have not inventoried the fences? Yes, I. that's a great thought. And that's also like along some sort of direction that we have been thinking about. Uh, we haven't tried yet, but um, currently the way that the algorithm works is you have to define a buffer area from the barrier. So then you can start to consider an encounter is a barrier encounter and then you classify the shape of the movement specifically of this encounter event so in order to reverse it i think we need to think about how do we define a potential cluster as a interaction with some sort of barrier so that definitely will be very interesting to see and i think some harder barriers like china mongolian boundary if you like look at the movement data, that will be very obvious that there is a hard boundary around the 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 movement. So, yeah, I think we will want to think more about that direction and maybe hopefully using that. But then another 
I think another problem is for many remote areas, like in the US, we have a lot of colored animals, but then in many areas like in Tibet, we just simply don't have any animals that's colored by GPS data. So is it easier to like actually go there, record the fence location versus then we try to put colors on animals? That's like a whole nother kind of logistic balance. Ed has asked, virtual fencing will soon be on the market. Will wire fences be continued to be necessary? Actually, I will really hope that uh, virtual fencing can be more available or accessible to, to more people. Uh, like right now, I would, as an ecologist, I would hope that um, people start to realize oh, virtual fencing would work uh, as good and it's like not necessary anymore to have an actual fences there and then will be so much better for the landscape connectivity. Um, but then some other problem will be once they decided to not use, there are like so many old fences that just get forgotten in the landscape and people just stop using that. They, they have no use anymore, but they just like kept being on the landscape and just actually being more dangerous to the animal because their lack of maintenance and they're really easy to be, uh, animal really easy to be trapped in these wires. So I definitely hope that uh, virtual fencing can be more prevalent in the market um, and for conservation purposes. Sarah asks, um, coming from uh, the Midwest and having done work out this way, um, there's a variety of perspectives and interactions um, between uh, landowners, ranch workers, and um, fence modifiers. So how have proposals such as these for fence modifications been received and what are some of the primary concerns from landowners? I think some, uh, for the second question, the primary concern from the landowner is definitely like, first, who is going to share the cost? And also whether the wildlife friendly fence is, is as functional for the livestock purpose purposes as the, as the one they already have. And then I think landowners, a lot of landowners are actually very actually are them, themselves the stewards for the land themselves. So they definitely will want to see a functional ecosystem. So on that side, they actually care, do care about keeping the landscape connected. So uh, how do we kind of communicate with, kind of help them to solve the other kind of logistic and financial concerns? Uh, that will be our job as uh, scientists, I think. Uh, and what's the first question, sorry? Yeah, the, the first question was, Hold it back down here. Um, how have proposals for fence modifications been received? Um, is, that, is that a favorable consideration or is that met with a bit of resistance? I would say, Corey, you might be a better person to answer this question. You work way more directly with local landowners. How do, what's your viewpoint? Yeah, I'll, I'll give the classic response and that is it depends. Um, it all depends on the individual landowner, what their needs of the the land is how it's being used, um, you know, whether that's a, a, a obstacle with um, the what they're maintaining on the landscape, whether that's livestock or if that's an issue with a use outside of that landscape. Um, I don't think there is a one size fits all, uh, but I think so much of um, things like this when it comes to uh, creating a modification or change, um, it begins with building a partnership and partnerships are built on trust. Um, so first thing to be done is to have a conversation and really kind of see where um, different people are at. Yeah, thank you for your more on the from the ground experience. Winjing, I have a question for you. Um, uh -huh. Looking around out here, uh, I drive, I live in, um, I rent a place in Wapiti, uh, which is about 25 miles west of Cody. And so every day driving into town, you know, I pass these fences and I see these wildlife um, trying to get from one side to the other. Um, and you tend to see a lot of fences along roadways. Um, one of the questions that's come up for me is, is fence density here that we see in, in the West or in maybe more specifically the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, is that density relatively common elsewhere in the world or um, is this an anomaly on the spectrum? I, I would actually say that uh, the fence density here in the US like and maybe Canada are relatively 
uh, at the lower side of the density, if one rangeland, especially for rangeland ecosystem, a lot of fences that I've seen in Tibet and also uh, recorded in East Africa, they're way more dense than that. Is one part of the reason is because the landowners, um, they are like small hold land, small hold, small producers. So like they kind of like household based. So they only like circle around the area that's around their own house or sometime the um, government program kind of for ask the landowners to fence their different seasonal pastures and then with the more higher human density in that kind of areas so each land that are enclosed are actually more like way smaller than what we see here in the US so I will say the density wise in um kind of like in Asia and in Africa is way higher and also the way fencing distribute is very different. As I mentioned in the presentation in the West, it's more like a fence in system. You have a big large of land and you start kind of a checkboard fence to divide the land. But then in Asia and in Africa, it's more like they, they started to do this like smaller, uh, fen smaller fences around bigger fences. And they're more like salt and pepper as I would show in uh, one of the slide. So it's super interesting to see, to think about how the social context and economic context to shape the formation and distribution of fences in different systems. Excellent response, thank you. Paul has asked, uh, for pronghorn, when you detected trace behavior, did they tend to end in a fence crossing? This would suggest for pronghorn, they are moving along a fence line, not looking for a place to cross, but traveling to place traveling to a place they know they can cross. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I haven't really uh, looked into each encounter event that we uh, we can, we observe like why they're doing certain things. That's actually the next part of my uh, research is to really look into why certain animals do certain behaviors at certain places versus some animals just don't do that. And I think that's an excellent point to like also think about the general formation of fences in the area where they do the um, different uh, it's like tracing behavior. And I would wonder whether in some way we can compile these behaviors so we can actually identify the uh, like the traditional crossing spot for these animals. And that will be even more higher priority in terms of um, modification or conservation for that specific spot. George has a question. Um, this one, I do not know the answer of offhand. Um, he asks, doesn't the State Department of Transportation own the fences along the state highway? And does the state have a fence standard? Hmm, I actually don't know about who owns the highway fences. Uh, but I think the state is trying to push for fence standard, but I as as far as I know, they so far, because so many fences are also on the private land, it's really hard to really push for a standard. And also the type of fencing, wildlife fencing, it's like a guide and it's for um, if for landowner if they want to make their fences more, more permeable. And that's like a recommendation for the type of standard. So I'm not sure there is, and also like for different type of fencing, that's specific for like rent livestock fencing. And then I think infrastructure fencing is a whole nother story and they may have, um, yeah, short answer, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I would add to that. It's also possible that those, those standards um, have been updated over time. Um, so perhaps when uh, the first set of standards came out, um, it wasn't, in full, fully encompassing of perhaps what those obstacles, limitations, or restrictions might be to, to certain wildlife. And as more um, research like this is conducted to say, hey, this works well for some species, this works, this doesn't, um, perhaps that's where these recommendations really come up and those standards become upgraded over time um, because of research like this. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Oh, and Jenny has added to this that the uh, Wyoming Department of Transportation has different needs for fencing. For example, around wildlife crossings, the fence can be used to funnel wildlife, while other areas they may prefer more permeable fencing. Thank you for that addition, Jenny. 
Um, I have another one more to throw out to you. Um, and if anybody else has any, please, you know, feel free. So fences have had this extraordinary impact upon the landscape. Um, and my understanding is that the migration routes, um, the path that a particular animal takes is passed down from adult to offspring. Um, in your research, have you come across evidence of species abandoning historical migration routes or corridors? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. I think it's going to be really hard to answer this question in the Western landscape because fences are here for more than 100 years and we don't really have like, you know, GPS data, but we probably will have some historical record for where our migration, where were migration occurring, but then the reason they disappear might be a whole mix of different reasons that we, it's really hard to trace back, but that actually brings the importance to study fences in other type of landscape when fencing is exponentially increasing right now, because that kind of change is happening in a such a short of amount of time and we might be able to record all these changes that is currently happening and using that insights to inf kind of infer back to what we he have here, whether it's interesting to think about what, why pronghorn move in this way as what it is right now, is that because they already changed from their historical movement pattern or that's, that's just how they always uh, move. And I did see some uh, cases like in Tibet, there are Tibetan antelopes changing migration route, but we don't know whether it's like something hereditary, like it will be passing down for the generation, whether if we open up for the old um, migration routes, again, will they go back to the historical one? Plus we have, on top of everything, we have changing climate and everything. So it's really hard to say first whether the historical movement pattern is still the good one for right now. And also, you know, just what's gonna happen as the landscape and climate keep changing. Those are all extremely good points, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share or would like our online audience to know? Hmm. I think I think I kind of said it in the, uh, you know, when I showed the poem uh, of Robert Frost. I feel like there's so much more about fences and it's really we're just at the beginning of fence ecology and um, really putting this kind of thing that has been on the landscape for a really long time and we almost forget about the social and ecological importance of it and then kind of putting back to the context it just reveals so much more you know interesting and also kind of concerning how humans have been shaping the earth shaping the landscapes in certain way but I do think fence ecology is a very kind of typical field that will require interdisciplinary research because kind of as I mentioned in the presentation it has been used as a management tool and it has been used to create the sense of property and also change human relationships with landscape and with each other all these social dynamics can also later reflect on the ecosystem so in order to really accurately interpret what we see on the landscape we really need to combine the both of the changing ecosystem and the changing social system to actually capture what is actually going on and also how to mediate negative impacts that we see. Wenjing, thank you for your time, taking the time out of your busy schedule to spend with us, um, to share your wealth of knowledge and your experience. Um, a big thank you again to our sponsors for supporting the Lunchtime Expedition Series. Um, we, I will be uh, uploading this um, to YouTube uh, this afternoon, so if there's anything you missed or you'd like to revisit anything that Wenjing discussed, um, you'll be able to find it there. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Wenjing, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. We wish you the best of luck <laughs> in all of your current and future endeavors, and we hope to see you in Cody soon. Yeah, thank you so much. And feel free to email me if you have extra questions about fences or want to talk about anything about that. You bet, will do. All right, till next time, we'll see everyone uh, again in March, uh, first Thursday of March for our next time, lunch on expedition presentation. Thank you all and have a fantastic day. Bye. Bye.